Let's continue our discussion on the digestive system. Here we're looking at a great drawing of some muscles of the neck and the head. And the reason I have this image is just to show you some muscles of mastication or chewing. And we'll just focus on four muscles or four general groups of muscles. Right here is a temporalis muscle. And this is a really great muscle that's going to be attaching superiorly up here to the temporal lines on the parietal bones. So if you've ever studied the bones of the skull and you learned about the temporal lines, which are on the parietal bone, it would be normal if that was somewhat confusing to you if to see that the temporal lines are on the parietal bone and not on the temporal bone. But they're on the parietal bone, or I should say they are called the temporal lines, which are on the parietal bone, because this temporalis muscle attaches to that specific region of the parietal bone, hence the name temporal lines. And if you ever watch an individual who has a shaved head when they are chewing, you often can see the contraction of the temporalis muscle. So it's pretty cool to watch that. This right here is a huge muscle of mastication. This is a masseter muscle right here. This is the buccinator running horizontally here. And these are a group of muscles known as the pterygoid muscles, which will attach to the pterygoid plates of the sphenoid bone. Okay, so let's talk about saliva. So in the last lecture, we talked about the teeth and we talked about the taste buds, but saliva plays a huge part in digestion. Keep in mind, digestion is both the mechanical breakdown of food, which is achieved via the teeth initially in the mouth, and a chemical breakdown. And saliva does have some enzymes that help the chemical breakdown of food to initiate the chemical breakdown of food, such as the salivary amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates, specifically starches that we are consuming. And it also releases a salivary lipase, which will help break down fats. Now, to be clear, anytime you see the suffix ASE, like lipase, that is suggesting it is an enzyme. Lipase, for example, is the enzyme that breaks down lipids. Proteases are enzymes that break down proteins. Amylase doesn't really fit that model as well. But please keep in mind that amylase is an enzyme that initiates the breakdown of carbohydrates, specifically starches. In this image right here, this is not my image. It looks like Kevin Bacon. I'm not sure if it was intended to do so, but we are looking at three salivary glands, the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, and the sublingual gland. Parotid gland, submandibular gland, and sublingual gland. These are all paired glands. That is to say, we see a parotid gland right here on the left side of and there's going to be a parotid gland on the right side. Same for the submandibular and the sublingual, sublingual glands. The submandibular gland is actually on the medial aspect of the mandible. And the sublingual gland is right below the tongue. The parotid gland is immediately anterior to the external acoustic meatus, which we see right here. This would be the mastoid process. And right here that's being covered about, up by the parotid gland would be the temporal mandibular joint. There are other salivary glands known as intrinsic glands. So to be clear, these three glands I just talked about, parotid, submandibular, and sublingual, are referred to as extrinsic salivary glands. But there are a number of intrinsic glands that are embedded directly into tissues of the mouth, such as the tongue, the gingiva, the soft palate, what have you. And the purpose of saliva, and saliva contains water, ions, mucus, enzymes that we just talked about. One purpose is to moisten. It's one moistening the mouth so it doesn't dry out over the course of time, but it's also helping moisten food that is being broken down. And it helps form what's known as a bolus. So when we consume food, it's broken down, it's moistened, and it's formed into somewhat of a compact structure that we refer to as a bolus.
Once the bolus gets down in the stomach, we refer to it as chyme, but prior to the stomach, we refer to it as a bolus of food. Additionally, saliva contains bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is a huge buffer for pH. That is to say, it helps regulate pH in our body. Saliva has antibacterial properties with an enzyme known as a lysozyme. Antiviral properties, it has antibodies, IgA is an antibody found within our saliva. And it also stimulates the growth of good bacteria. So to be clear, there is bad bacteria and there is good bacteria. And our body has a wealth of really good bacteria, both in the stomach, but initiating within the saliva of the oral cavity. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about is the digestive canal. And what we'll look at in the subsequent image is the initiation or the beginning of the digestive canal, which would go from the oropharynx all the way down to the anus. So the oropharynx down to the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine. And the makeup of this canal is pretty much the same along its course with some variation. This is one layer right here. Keep in mind, this is the lumen of the digestive tract. This is what the bolus or the chyme would be passing through. So one layer from here to here, which is known as the mucosa. Another layer right here, which is the submucosa. Keep in mind, sub means below. And when we look at this right here, this certainly, visually speaking, is not below the mucosa. But if we were to slice this tube open and lay it out flat, this would all be below the mucosa. So it's certainly below it right here. And if that doesn't make sense, that's totally okay. But just trust me, we refer to this as the submucosa. The next layer right here in red is a muscularis externa. And outside of that, the tan area is what we refer to as the serosa. So the mucosa is composed of simple columnar epithelial tissue, which is the makeup of the great majority of the digestive tract. We'll talk about the esophagus and pharynx made up of stratified squamous, but once you get down into the stomach, down to the sigmoid colon, it's all simple columnar epithelial tissue. Like all epithelial tissue in the body, it's underlaid by a layer of loose areolar connective tissue known as the lamina propria. And it has an underlying or outer muscularis layer of smooth muscle known as the muscularis mucosa. One thing I do want to say embedded within the lamina propria are some immune cells, aggregations of immune cells that we refer to as MALT. MALT stands for mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. The submucosa right here is composed of a loose areolar, sometimes dense irregular connective tissue. It has a ton of elastic fibers in it. And the elastic fibers play a very important role because the digestive tract is going to expand when the bolus of food or chyme is passing through it. And once it is stretched out and the contents have moved on downstream, we want that canal to return back to its original shape. And that's the role of these elastic fibers. Keep in mind the property of elasticity is not necessarily to stretch, but to return back to its original shape after having been stretched. Then we find the muscularis externa. And there's two layers of the muscularis externa. When we get to the stomach, we'll see three layers. But generally speaking, there are two layers. There is a inner layer of circular muscle that runs the circumference of this tube. Say if you were to put a rubber band around a tube, that's running along its circumference. This is what we refer to as circular muscle. This is still smooth muscle, and it helps squeeze the digestive tract. And the outer layer is longitud longitudinal muscle that is running the length of the tube or the length of the GI tract. And when longitudinal muscle contracts, it shortens. So the circular muscle squeezes, the longitudinal muscle shortens. Collectively, they help out in the movement of substances within the GI tract. And the movement of the GI tract in this manner 
is what is referred to as peristalsis. So muscularis externa has two layers, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. The outermost layer is what's known as serosa. It's the same thing as the visceral peritoneum. So in previous videos, we talked about serous membranes, serous membranes of the lungs, serous membranes of the heart, and there are also serous membranes of the abdominal cavity. There's a visceral and parietal peritoneum covering the abdominal cavity and the organs of the abdominal cavity. The outermost is the parietal, but the serous membrane directly adhering to the organs of the abdominal cavity, and in this case, to the gastrointestinal tract, is the visceral peritoneum. And the visceral peritoneum is the same thing as the serosa. And this is composed of simple squamous epithelial tissue that is also referred to as mesothelium. And certainly that underlying connective tissue, the areolar connective tissue that underlies all epithelial tissue. Now, to be clear, the serosa only exists around the digestive tract within the abdominal cavity because the visceral peritoneum is only in the abdominal cavity. So if we're looking at the esophagus, for example, which is superior to the diaphragm and not in the abdominal cavity, it does not have a visceral peritoneum and hence it does not have a serosa. So the esophagus superior to the abdominal cavity is certainly going to have the first three layers we talked about, the mucosa, submucosa, and the muscularis externa. But instead of having a serosa, it has a fibrous connective tissue overlying the muscularis externa that we refer to as adventitia. And the kidneys are an interesting case where they are in the abdominal cavity, but they are posterior to the peritoneum. So the anterior surface of kidneys is covered by serosa, but the posterior surface of the kidneys is covered by adventitia. So generally speaking, the layers of the digestive tract are mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa. Okay, I just want to look at the pharynx really quick. We've looked at this image when we were talking about the respiratory tract. So just for clarification, this right here is the trachea. This is the larynx, oral cavity, nasal cavity. And we have the pharynx, which includes the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, which gives rise to the esophagus right here. To be very clear, the esophagus, which is part of the digestive tract, is immediately posterior to the trachea, which is not part of the digestive tract. So the components of the pharynx that make up the digestive tract are the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. So oropharynx right here, laryngopharynx right here. The nasopharynx is not part of the digestive tract. The oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are composed of, of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The nasopharynx is composed of pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. And the reason why the nasopharynx is, does not have stratified squamous, or the other way I should say this, is why does the oropharynx and laryngopharynx have stratified squamous and the nasopharynx does not? And that is because there's a lot of abrasion that can occur due to the passage of that bolus from the oral cavity into the pharynx on route to the esophagus. And the esophagus is composed of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Opening within the diaphragm that the esophagus passes through is known as the esophageal hiatus. And the muscle that makes up the esophagus is very interesting because it's composed of both skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. The upper portion of the esophagus is exclusively skeletal muscle, and the lower portion of the esophagus is exclusively smooth muscle. In between the two, there is a combination of smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Okay, so let's take a look at the stomach, which we have right here. This is the esophagus. 
and this is the stomach right here. This is the beginning of the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. The regions of the stomach are the cardiac region right here. Keep in mind, the stomach is immediately below the diaphragm, and hence it's also immediately below the heart. So this is called the cardiac region of the stomach because it's right next to the heart. There's actually a cardiac sphincter right here, which helps prevent back movements of chyme from the stomach into the esophagus. Keep in mind, we have a bolus passing through the esophagus and it turns into chyme once it's in the stomach. This region right here is the fundus of the stomach and it's generally, if not always, superior to the cardiac region. The great majority of the stomach is referred to as the body. So I would say this is the fundus from here to here. And then the rest of this region is the body until we come right here. And this is the pyloric region. And there's a sphincter in here that controls the movement of the chyme into the duodenum and hopefully help, helps prevent backflow of substances from the small intestine into the stomach. The stomach is lined by folds known as rugae, which I'm trying to illustrate right here. And these folds cause for an undulating pattern within the innermost lining of the stomach. But during a full stomach or a distended stomach, the lining of the stomach smooths out to help expand during an increase in contents within the gastric region. This is known as the lesser curvature of the stomach. And this portion right here is the greater curvature of the stomach. So one thing I'm showing right here are the lining of the layers of the muscularis externa. And what we previously talked about is the general makeup of the digestive tract has two layers in the muscularis externa. The stomach has a third layer and it's the innermost layer, which is the oblique and the muscle fibers are running obliquely. Then the middle layer is the circular layer and the outermost layer is the longitudinal layer. So the muscularis externa of the stomach has an innermost oblique layer, a circular layer, and a longitudinal layer. Okay, so this image right here is intended to represent the lining of the stomach. Keep in mind, we're looking down upon that epithelial tissue. So we're looking at the apical surface of these columnar cells, which we don't really see in this image right here. All of these structures within this image are meant to represent gastric pits. And these are funnels, if you will, into the deeper regions of the mucosa. Keep in mind, the mucosa is the innermost layer of the digestive tract. So if we were to dive deep into this gastric pit, we would end up moving from the apical surface of the mucosa towards the basal surface of that mucosa. So once again, we have this arrow going down directly into this pit, which would take us to this right here. So this right, this space right here is that gastric pit diving deep into the mucosa. And this hole from here to here is the mucosa. This is the muscle layer of the mucosa known as the muscularis mucosa. These are the simple cuboidal epithelial cells. And this is the opening I was trying to demonstrate in the previous image. And this right here is a gastric pit. Every gastric pit of the stomach lining is going to lead into two or three gastric glands. This is a gastric gland and this is a gastric gland. From here to here is the mucosa. This right here in green is the submucosa. This is the muscularis externa with the oblique layer, the circular layer, and the longitudinal layer. And this right here is the serosa. So let's take a closer look at these gastric glands and gastric pits. Okay, so right here is connective tissue. Here's the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue we've talked about. Keep in mind that these are the nuclei. 
and the nuclei are in the bottom third or bottom half of most of these cells, that's how that's one way to we determine it's simple columnar rather than simple cuboidal. It'd be more of a circular nuclei right in the center of those cells. We can actually see it represented much better on this side right here. This is the gastric pit right here leading to a gastric gland here and a gastric gland right here. So there are a number of cells that make up the gastric gland and these cells are going to produce substances that are going to help the chemical breakdown of food. So all these substances eventually are going to proceed superiorly from the gastric gland through the gastric pits into the lumen of the stomach. And I don't need you to memorize which cells are which here. The most common cells of the gastric glands are the chief cells and chief cells release a lipase known as a gastric lipase that helps break down fats. Chief cells also secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is an inactive precursor to a enzyme known as pepsin, which helps break down proteins. Pepsin is converted to, or pepsinogen is converted to pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. So within the gastric glands, I'm going to say in orange right here, these are chief cells. They're the most numerous of the cells of the gastric glands. And they release the gastric lipase and pepsinogen. Another common cell of the gastric glands are the parietal cells. And the parietal cells are secreting the hydrochloric acid that helps in digestion. It helps defend against any pathogens that have entered the digestive tract. That hydrochloric acid is also helping convert pepsinogen to pepsin. The parietal cells are additionally releasing intrinsic factor, which is a signaling molecule responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12. And lastly, the parietal cells release a hormone known as ghrelin, which increases the drive to consume or take in more food. There are mucus cells additionally within these gastric glands that produce an additional amount of mucus above and beyond which is produced by the goblet cells within the simple columnar epithelial tissue and we have endocrine cells otherwise known as enteroendocrine cells that release the hormone known as gastrin which increases motility of the gi tract when the stomach has distended or expanded due to the accumulation of food within the stomach or the accumulation of chyme within the stomach. Now, one question people may ask is the hydrochloric acid that is released into the lumen of the stomach is extremely corrosive. It has a pH of roughly two. And that if it were poured onto your skin, that would burn your skin. So the question people may have is why does it not destroy the lining of the stomach? And there's three quick answers to that. One, to a certain degree it does, but fortunately the epithelial cells of the stomach regenerate very quickly. Let's say I think after about five or six days, but the mucus that lines the stomach helps protect the cells of the stomach. And there's also tight junctions between the epithelial cells, which merely hold those cells tightly together to help prevent the hydrochloric acid from seeping into the deeper layers of the digestive tract. That is to say, into the serosa, submucosa, and the muscularis externa. I realize that was not in order. So let's say helping protect the epithelial tissue, the submucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa. More on the digestive tract next week.